How to think critically. Question, analyze, reflect, debate. The Critical Thinker, Book 6. Written by Albert Rutherford. Narrated by Russell Newton. At its core, critical thinking is the ability to look at things logically, to put together, to form judgments, and make decisions. Critical thinking was popularized in the critical thinking movement of the 1980s, which was born from the belief that the rote memorization methods in schools were not the best way to teach students. Instead, the movement suggested that children learn better when they can be hands-on, learning by doing and discovering concepts themselves. From that point onward, education became not just about imparting information through incantations and repetition and expecting it to be absorbed, but about teaching the students how to find their own connections and meaning from lessons, making them active participants in the process of learning, rather than just recitation machines. The results were improved long-term memorization and strengthened skills that would be valuable for employers, ensuring that students graduated not just with knowledge, but with the tools to build that comprehension even further and grow and learn for the rest of their lives. Clearly, the movement was on to something as the evolution to schooling was lasting and remains apparent in education even today, showing no signs of going out of style anytime soon. From teachers to business executives and political leaders, most people continue to seek critical thinking as an essential skill that students need in order to be successful in the workplace and in life, but some people are much better at it than others. Those who look at solving problems with hard facts and statistics who listen to people's wild stories with a critical ear, who fact-check and source their material, and who ask frequent questions are good critical thinkers. These people are stronger at debating because they come up with evidence that is harder to argue against and are more willing to look at another viewpoint or be impartial because they take advice from all sides before deciding their own opinion. They never go with just their gut feeling and rarely act on their emotions. And they're always researching and asking questions to get to the bottom of things. What does a critical thinker look like? Although critical thinking can present itself in many ways, there are three telltale signs of a good critical thinker. A certain skepticism. A healthy dose of skepticism is necessary for being a good critical thinker because it ensures you don't just deny or accept things at face value, but instead wait to gather more information or hear the other side of the story. This isn't necessarily about disbelieving other people and what they tell you, but opening your mind to the possibility that they have a limited view or biases that they might not even know are skewing their facts. A natural curiosity. Curiosity may have killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. Likewise, Critical thinkers are always seeking more information and greater understanding, continuing to dig deeper until they're satisfied that they have an honest and true answer. Good critical thinkers will often find themselves studying topics that were mentioned in conversations they had earlier in the day, asking a lot of follow-up questions to a story, and diving into the details of things they hear about in their day-to-day -day lives. They are students of life who love the pursuit of knowledge. Humility. Critical thinkers have an open mind and are willing to accept the perspectives of others, even if they go against their own. They prize being factual over being right, and they don't see debate as a win-lose game, but a way to get an answer or come to a conclusion. They don't cling blindly to their beliefs, but are willing to accept new evidence and allow it to shape their judgment. Benefits of Critical Thinking Critical thinking may conjure up ideas of classroom exercises and academic research. It may seem like a formal skill used only for poking holes in claims and debating, but it's far more practical than that. Critical thinking allows you to make informed decisions, to recognize what's morally right or wrong, and what is honest and true. Being a good critical thinker also means you have a penchant for analysis and openness to accept new knowledge, and an insatiable desire for deeper understanding, whether that's deciphering what news sources are correct, finding the lowest price for the sweater you've been eyeing, or deciding what career path is best for achieving your life goals. 
Thinking critically can improve your life in so many areas. Research has shown that those who are better critical thinkers can make connections between ideas in ways that other people cannot and judge the importance and significance of ideas more easily. They're also more efficient at identifying quality arguments and evidence and can find errors in reasoning, whether it be their own or others, making them more likely to succeed and less apt to grow frustrated by challenges. Critical thinking can even promote creativity because it teaches you the importance of thinking in new ways and relying on the power of your own mind rather than accepting things as they are. Also, it relies on questioning ideas and looking at the big picture, which are often a part of the artistic process. Reflection. Are you a critical thinker? Use these questions to reflect on how you react when faced with problems. Make sure to be honest with yourself. No one's listening. Do you take into account alternative solutions and opinions even when they go against something you believe? Do you have a natural curiosity? Do you enjoy learning new things? Do you consider yourself to be a lifelong learner who enjoys seeking out new knowledge? Are you confident in your reasoning skills? Do you wait to pass judgment until you have all the facts? Do you keep an open mind when it comes to differing viewpoints? Are you understanding of others' ideas and opinions? Do you try to be fair and impartial when assessing evidence? Are you aware of and honest about your biases, stereotypical thinking, and prejudices? Are you willing to go where the facts take you, even if it means changing or dismissing previously held opinions? Are you able to create quality questions and identify problems accurately? Are you good at gathering evaluating and interpreting new information? Do you take the time to make sure the answers you find are correct and of high quality, rather than just relying on them being an answer to a given solution? Do you recognize your own biases and that of others, and try your best to overcome them? Can you effectively communicate your ideas and questions to others in a way that allows them to help you find answers and build off your ideas? If you can honestly answer yes to a majority of these questions on most days, then you just might be a critical thinker. But that doesn't mean this book can't help you. As you may already know, critical thinking is an ongoing process and can always be improved. If you answered no, don't worry. By picking up this book, you've already shown a natural curiosity and taken your first step on the right path to improving your reasoning. In the following sections, We'll explore some concepts for achieving deeper understanding and methods to upgrade your reasoning skills developed by some of the greatest minds on the topic. No matter how critical of a thinker you are or aren't, there are a few practical tips and tricks that can help you start to build your skills. All you need is a willingness to put in the time and effort and take on the mentality of a lifelong learner who's open to new knowledge. No matter who you are or your current skill level, if you open your mind and practice enough, you can hone your critical thinking abilities in a way that will make you more confident and enhance your quality of life. Our minds are made to think, but the way they think can be altered with practice. Because stereotypes and biases are a way of shortcutting our thinking, our brains see them as the more efficient thought process and will rely heavily on them when left to their own devices. In comparison, research, skepticism, formulating questions, and other aspects of critical thinking take much more brain power and require our minds to work harder. To our minds, this is like deciding between going for a short walk or taking on a marathon. The walk seems much more doable and less strenuous, but if we practice running enough, the marathon will not be that difficult. Likewise, if we work our critical thinking muscles, our brain will find them more natural to use and those longer paths will be worn in and made more accessible and welcoming. It takes a lot of effort to get to this point, just like it takes a lot of work to be able to run a marathon, but it will slowly become easier and easier with practice. Plus, the benefits are extraordinary. We can learn to break away from our biases and have a more open mind, 
allowing us to communicate and explore ideas rather than becoming stuck in the same old cycles of reasoning. Non-critical, weakly critical, and strongly critical thinking. Critical thinking can be difficult because it's not black and white. Good reasoning comes in varying degrees. Sometimes your approach or another's will be better than other times, but that's okay. If you can recognize the difference between a critical approach and a non-critical approach and be able to use your own critical thinking energy wisely. Being a good critical thinker is about taking the multitude of opportunities you have in a day to use your reasoning and deduction skills and putting them to good use with the limited resources you have. Our modern world is overpopulated with information, bombarding us from all sides. It takes a shrewd eye to pick out which ones are critical and significant sources and which have little to offer. Realizing how critical you or others are being in a certain situation will allow you to understand what kind of conclusion you've come to or to establish how critical the material you're taking in is. Oftentimes, what appear to be good critical arguments on the surface are really just non-critical or weakly critical reasoning marauding as something more thorough. Therefore, the first step to critical thinking is being able to acknowledge when evidence is flawed versus when it's wrong, whether it's your own or that of material you're taking in. Non-critical A non-critical approach is to accept information at face value, without question or challenge. This is usually how we address material given to us by a trusted source who we assume we can put our faith into, but it can also occur when we agree with the opinions being stated, or when the explanation makes sense to us and leads to logical-sounding conclusions. For example, we may read a news article and accept that the basis and statements of the piece are in line with reality because we assume news articles are inherently well-researched and objective. Because of this, we don't look deeper into any inaccuracies or biases that may or may not exist. The problem with non-critical thinking is that it often relies on feelings and emotions rather than facts. These senses can sometimes be so overwhelming that we take them as hard evidence. When we trust a friend's judgment, for instance, it's usually based on our relationship with them more than it's about their actual knowledge or skills, yet we still see them as a reliable resource. Even if this friend is brilliant and often knows what they're talking about, it's a tricky situation to put your faith into someone so wholeheartedly. You may never perceive when and if they're wrong. It's important to remember that these feelings you have aren't tied to the information itself, and don't necessarily make the claim true. A non-critical source will trust too much in information that may not be reputable, often lean in a particular direction, and may not include much research or has poor research. The red flag of a non-critical source would be that it doesn't list other sources or takes all its data from one place or person and doesn't provide much original material or analysis. Weekly Critical a weakly critical approach addresses inaccuracies or incorrect conclusions while still accepting the main assumptions or concepts presented. Weakly critical means being wary, but willing to accept the given statements. For example, being weakly critical of a new article would mean looking at any linked sources and background research used to see if it has been misconstrued or taken out of context and examining the partisanship and standing of the newsroom the article came from. You may find when you take a closer look that the arguments it poses are quite flimsy, such as by taking all its data from one source or not including much thorough background research. To engage in a conversation with a trusted friend with a weekly critical approach, you may ask where they heard their information from or how they come to know so much about a certain topic. Remember that you're not necessarily looking to disprove something, but simply trying to look at how thorough that material is. Is it a file heaping with documents or a few slim bits of paper? Is it a textbook filled with small print or a leaflet? This will help you verify whether there's more you should look into or if the given data is sufficient. Skepticism in a healthy amount 
doesn't mean you're difficult to please or combative, but that you simply have the independence to make your own decisions. As Ronald Reagan often mentioned, the rhyming Russian proverb, trust but verify. A weekly critical source may be recognized by its minimal or limited research. In some cases, it may look like it has many sources, but these may come from the same place or from the same small group of people who are likely biased. It may come to conclusions or contain analysis, but it is usually minimal or overgeneralized. Strongly critical. In this approach, The material is taken apart and examined from every angle, investigating every piece of it, from the authority of the source to the soundness of every piece of evidence. Other research is also taken into account at this stage to reveal whether the stated stance is an outlier or is in agreement with others. Assumptions and biases are looked at and errors or weakness in reasoning are sought out, not only in the information itself, but in others that it cites as sources. If you took a strongly critical approach to dissect a news article, you would look into the predilections of the media outlet and its standing and perhaps even those of the author. You would not only look at the sources cited, but also go a step further into doing your own research and seeing if the same results come up or if there are differing theories. You might find that quotes have been taken out of context, that statistics and data have been copied without being bothered to be analyzed, that facts have been conveniently left out, or that sources have been disproven. Or, you could find that the piece checks out, and through your investigation, have an even greater understanding of the topic that you can use in the future. To be strongly critical of a friend would mean that you ask follow-up questions and inquire with other people about their thoughts on the matter. A strongly critical source will have a lot of analysis and research that comes from a variety of places and will have an objective stance. It will rely on facts more than opinions and will be verifiable by other sources. Uncritical, illogical thinking. To become a good critical thinker, you must come to terms with the fact that we as humans often make mistakes in our reasoning and come to incorrect conclusions but these errors can be predicted. Awareness of your propensities and common mistakes will strengthen your critical thinking skills and make you less likely to blunder. Psychologists have sorted these mistakes in reasoning into two major categories, hot or motivational illusions and cold or cognitive illusions. Hot illusions are founded on feelings and emotions. These mistakes are often based on the assumption that the things we believe now We will always believe when, in truth, we're always growing and changing, and our thoughts can be altered quite drastically over the years. Cold illusions are errors in thinking, such as biases, mistakes in reasoning, or incorrectly identifying a problem. Unfortunately, both types are hardwired into our brains. Many experts believe this is because such jumps in reasoning allowed us to make quicker decisions in survival situations, when time was of the essence. Although that's no longer the case, in some ways these shortcuts can still be beneficial. Studies show that people who serve their own interests, even when presented with contradictory evidence, may achieve more in life and have greater motivation and productivity. For example, students who flaunt their achievements on entrance exams may be more likely to receive a scholarship or be accepted into university, even if they overestimated their abilities or overinflated their experiences. However, this tendency can too often lead to poor outcomes in the long run, resulting in decision-making and preparation errors because they feel that unfortunate circumstances and negative implications won't affect them. This attitude will also inflate their ego, making them feel superior to those around them in a way that can ostracize them and contribute to reestablishing biases and stereotypes. This will limit their viewpoint and make them less open to new information and experiences and less willing to take on new knowledge that will allow them to grow as a person. The Linda Problem The way our brain relies so heavily on assumptions and biases is a phenomenon that's been studied by experts in the field for decades. Slowly but surely, 
discoveries have been made that have allowed us to understand how to navigate them, such as that of the conjunction fallacy or the Linda problem. In 1883, psychology professors Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman conducted a study on unintentional bias by presenting a group of student participants with the following scenario. Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. The professors then gave the students a choice between two possible statements that would apply to Linda to see whether they would draw on preconceived stereotypes to make their decision when given so little information. Linda is a bank teller. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Although nothing in the description would lead participants to believe Linda would be a bank teller, it had been written in a way that suggested that she would be active in social justice, such as the feminist movement. But for the second option to be true, the first must also be true. Statistically, two pieces of specific information are always less probable than just one, making the second choice mathematically less likely to be correct. If that goes against your instinct, as it might, think of it this way. If you were asking the likelihood that you would be struck by lightning, you'd probably say it's pretty rare, right? But if you were asked the likelihood of being struck by lightning while being bitten by a shark, you would say it would be almost impossible. Both are very rare occurrences, so the likelihood they would both happen at the same time is so small, it's almost non-existent. Being a bank teller and a feminist are much more likely things to occur in day-to-day life, but they are still less likely to occur together because it relies on one already being true. Yet, you probably found yourself leaning towards the second option, didn't you? You're not alone. 86% of participants chose option two as well. By combining a piece of information that was likely with one that had no foundation in truth whatsoever, Kahneman and Tversky confirmed the implicit error in the reasoning of human beings, showing the way our brain's tendency to try to save energy causes it to take shortcuts to come up with answers faster instead of doing the research and putting in the effort to calculate a conclusion. When participants looked at the answers, their brain made the connection that being active in the feminist movement made sense with the description and had some relation. Therefore, their minds filled in the gaps and assumed that Linda must be a bank teller and chose the second option, as it appeared to fit more specifically with the facts given, even though there was nothing to back up that belief. Those who didn't answer with the second option might have second-guessed this conjecture and took a second to ask themselves, where's this bank teller part coming from? This question would lead them to see that there was no relevant connection. They may have even looked at it mathematically and found that the second option was statistically less probable than the first. However, this process would have taken longer and required a deeper level of thought, which the brain must be willing to participate in. Like those who face the Linda problem, most people rely on stereotypes to make decisions, even if they don't think they do. The brain loves to have these subconscious shortcuts, as it's a much quicker and a familiar way to do things, but they have the unfortunate trait of often being wrong. Critical thinkers take the time to become aware of what stereotypes and biases they rely on so they know when their brain is trying to do things the quick way and stop it from jumping to incorrect conclusions. This is a constant battle, but a necessary one, if we want to have profound and objective analysis that allows for greater understanding and more truthful and factual results. The problem with eyewitness accounts and memory. Not only does the brain like to pretend that our assumptions and emotions are good source material, it also tends to lead us to believe that its memory is more capable than it is. The longer it's been since an event has passed, the more likely it is that we'll see it as fact, even though it isn't. As we commit our experiences to memory, we deposit them into the Rolodex of our brains as a viable source of information, but in reality, humans are lousy at remembering things. 
we can usually only grasp the gist of what happened. These interpretations can also be misconstrued or misinterpreted by ourselves or others. Yet we still believe that eyewitness accounts are reliable sources. After all, they're used in court cases quite often. But these testimonies are only taken into account when they can be backed up by others. This is because two people can see the same thing and describe it in contrasting ways. This may simply be due to their view of the event or for a host of other reasons. For example, their opinions and biases could have altered their perspective on the matter. Who they talked to about it afterward might have swayed their perception, or their feelings and emotions at the time might have affected their memory. Even if an eyewitness account is completely accurate, which is almost impossible, a person's story can also be easily misunderstood or can be tainted by the way it was produced through specifically worded questions or manipulation by an interviewer. Still, that doesn't make eyewitness accounts completely worthless. When looked at in the right way and with the right tools and methods, such as Bayesian analysis, a lot can be gained from even such a partial account. Bayesian Analysis We often refer back to our emotional response as a form of fact, even when we know that the only reliable type of information is data and statistics. However, there is a strategy to combine both, allowing us to verify our experiences and interpretations with mathematical reasoning. Probability and statistics are powerful tools for a critical thinker. When used correctly, they can create hard data to back up or discredit what would otherwise be shaky reasoning, allowing us to investigate our hot illusions for deeper truths. This can be achieved with what's called Bayesian analysis. Bayesian analysis is a method of statistical inference that combines prior knowledge with evidence from a sample to guide research using probability in conjunction with real experiences, such as eyewitness accounts. For example, if a witness was asked to identify a car in a hit-and-run accident and said that the car was blue, Bayesian analysis would compare this new data with the likelihood of the car being blue to see the probability it would be correct. By taking the number of cars in the city and calculating the percentages of each color, it could be discovered how likely it was that the hit-and-run was caused by a blue car. For example, if 85% of cars in the city were green and 15% were blue, this would mean that a blue car would be less likely to be the culprit. Although this doesn't disprove the witness's statement, it does create greater context and clarity on the situation. However, if the witness was tested on their ability to correctly identify colors, this would give even greater insight into their account of the situation. Let's say they took a test and discovered they could identify a car's color 80% of the time. That makes them incorrect 20% of the time. When combined with the probability that the car was blue, this makes the likelihood that the witness was incorrect much more probable. Although it still doesn't disprove their account, such calculations certainly change the level of confidence others might have in the witness's description. Bayesian theory states that given the two events of D and H, where D stands for data and where H stands for hypothesis, the probability of D and H happening at the same time is the same as the probability of D occurring given H weighted by the P probability that H occurs or vice versa. Although this may look like a bunch of PhDs, this method is extremely useful and isn't as complicated as it sounds. Let's break it down. First, decide on your data and hypothesis. We know that our hypothesis is that the accident was caused by a blue car. You might want to say that the data is the percentage of blue cars in the city, as this gives a nice round number. But in truth, the data is that the witness said that the car was blue because that is the baseline evidence. Now, all that's left to do is to input our calculations into the formula to replace the letters. P of H becomes 15% for the 15% of cars that are blue in the city. P of D refers to the probability of the data. In this case, that would be the likelihood that the witness's statement is true, or 80%, as decided by the test that showed the witness could correctly identify the color 80% of the time. 
when we put all these into the formula, we come up with 0.8 times 0.15 plus 0.2 times 0.85 equals 0.29. The witness was right 80% of the time, which, when multiplied by the 15% likelihood of the car being blue based on city statistics, 0.15 times 0.80 results in a 12% chance that the car was blue. But the unlikelihood must also be taken into account. In other words, there was an 85% chance the car was green and a 20% chance the witness would incorrectly identify the color, 0.85 times 0.20, resulting in a 17% chance the car was green. Adding this together, 0.17 plus 0.12, we come up with the results that the witness would identify the car as being blue 29% of the time, or 29 times out of every 100 accounts. However, this doesn't factor in whether the witness would be right or wrong, to figure that out, we'll need to take one more step. Since the witness was correct 12% of the time, we can divide that likelihood by the number of occasions the witness would choose blue, 0.12 divided by 0.29, and find that the witness would be correct in choosing blue 41% of the time. Now we have an answer. Sort of. This percentage can't tell us whether the witness is correct or not only that they have a 41% chance of being correct. Even if there was only a 1% chance, it would still be possible that the one blue car in the city happened to be driving by and the witness took a shot in the dark despite being very bad at distinguishing colors and was correct. But in that case, it would be very unlikely they were correct. This background research gives us a lot more context than if we'd just taken the witness at their word. A 41% chance of being correct is fairly good, but not overwhelmingly positive, giving us some reason to doubt their account. This may mean we want to bring in more witnesses, or look deeper at the facts than if they had, say, a 90% likelihood of being correct. Reflection Now that you have a more thorough understanding of what critical reasoning is and what it's not, Let's take a look at something in your daily life, whether it's the story of a friend, a news article, a research paper, or some other material. Decide what your initial reaction to the material is, why you feel that way, and whether it's an emotional or logical response. Do you trust your friend's account because it makes sense, or because you react positively to them and want to trust your friend? Do you accept the statements of the research you've looked at because it's written formally, it sounds smart, and was authored by someone with a lot of credentials, or because the actual data and statistics back it up? Decide whether the material is non-critical, weakly critical, or strongly critical based on the things we've discussed, considering what can be verified and how. This has been... How to Think Critically, Question, Analyze, Reflect, Debate, The Critical Thinker, Book 6, written by Albert Rutherford, narrated by Russell Newton, copyright 2021 by Albert Rutherford, production copyright by Albert Rutherford.